And we only see ourselves as criminals or as immigrants, as um, people who clean houses or, or just do landscaping or people who are nannies. And that's it. And, and I'm talking from living in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is 50% Latino, predominantly Mexican. Also, um, California was once part of Mexico. So the history w- with the country is quite quite lengthy, but we, we don't see the whole representation. Welcome to Latinx in Power, a podcast hosted by Thaisa Fernandes. Welcome to Latinx in Power. It's an immense pleasure to have Rosa Para today. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Rosa Para is a Chicana born and raised in East LA. She became interested in films at a young age and just recently decided to become a film critic. Rosa is currently working towards her bachelor's in film and media studies. I'm a big fan of Rosa's podcast, Latinx Lens, about Latinx representation in film and television. So we are going to talk more about that, so I'm super excited about it. Oh, yes, me too. I can't, I can't wait to talk about it. Go. Cool. I always like to start with this question, so I'm excited to ask that to you. What does it mean to be a Latina for you? I think a, a Latina, in terms of, of the term itself, it, it's a self-proclaimed term, um, meaning that you can only identify yourself as one. Because, unfortunately, <laughs> we're in an era where where we try to, to always judge and put each other in boxes or always try to check off these social norms. But, but to me, a, a Latina, in, in my opinion, is someone who, who is from or descends uh, from a Latin American country country, which can be Mexico, the Caribbean, um, Central or South America. So yeah, in terms of the term, it's self-proclaimed. I personally do consider myself a Latina because my, my parents are, are both from Mexico, I, I, a Chicana meaning that, that I was born and, and raised here in the U.S., but from Mexican descent. And Unfortunately, when the term Latina comes in, 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 into play or when I hear the word Latina, um, I think diversity, I think uh, richness in cultures, uh, so, sadly, <laughs> underrepresentation, um, invisibility, uh, ancestry, because it, it's who I am, role models, and uh, sadly, again, marginalization. Uh, we were just so often forgotten. It, it, it's very unfortunate. Yeah. For sure. And I like that you brought the point that is a, a self-identified a term that I feel sometimes people don't talk much about it. And I think especially speaking about myself uh, in Brasilia, I know that there's like a lot of Brazilians who also they don't identify as a Latinx, maybe because of the language or maybe because of really lack of knowledge. So yeah, I really like that you brought this point too. Yes. And I know, I, I know a lot of people either who, who are from Mexico or descent from, from any of these countries who don't identify mm-hmm. as Latinos. Um, they either identify as Hispanic or they want to be more specific and they say, well, I'm Mexican or mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican or Dominican or they just specify what country they're from. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. perfectly fine. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's perfectly fine. No, nothing wrong with it. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's more of a U.S. <laughs> thing that, that these terms, uh, Hispanic and Latino, are, are coming to play. Yeah, the, the term Latinx I learned when I moved to the U.S. I think in Brazil, we, do, we don't talk about it. We, we are just starting to see ourselves and, as like Latinos and Latinas, but the term Latinx is it's not something that people were using. Yeah, same. Um, I think it, I, I've been to Mexico a few times and yeah, no, they don't use the term there either. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, I know you're super vocal on Twitter regarding the words Latina and Latino versus Latinx, which I think it's awesome. It's also that you're talking about it. And I love to hear your perspective. And as I said, as a Brazilian who moved to the U.S. six years ago, I really learned this term when I moved. And I know there's a lot of discussions about it. And I'm always hearing, seeing people talking. So I love to hear your perspective. Yes, the United States, it's a country that it's either one of the few or if not the only one where where compartmentalization it's a norm 
Um, mm-hmm. You have to put yourself in a group or the mm-hmm. government always has to place you somewhere. They have to mm-hmm. put you inside a box. Unfortunately, it, it first started with, with the term Hispanic and, and, and anybody that, that was a Spanish speaking descent country, they were automatically Hispanic because uh, I guess either they're lazy to not um, want to either know about the people and, and know mm-hmm. where, where their ancestry is, know about the different countries. So they just use an umbrella term and bundle all of us in it together. Mm -hmm. Just recently, the term Latino. Latino has also been been around for a few years, but I think Latinx or Latinx, it's more of a newer term. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's predominantly used more in in academics because it is new. Not a lot of people are going to know about it. Biologically speaking, uh, we do tend to be very frightened uh, of the unknown. So when there comes a term Latinx, of course, people are going to be like, a bit hesitant to use it. Of course, more hesitant to use the term to identify themselves as. The term, in my opinion, it's more of a gender gender neutral term. It, it incorporates uh, individuals who don't identify as either men or women who are non-binary. Of course, if I know a person does identify as a woman or as a man, then in that case, I'll go ahead and move forward and use the word Latina or Latino mm-hmm. or however they wish to ident- be identified as. Mm-hmm. Um, but the origins of, of the term itself, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's from Latinos themselves. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it does come from people who are non-binary. Uh-huh. And of course, it, it has a lot also to do with the Spanish language. Um, Spanish language has been very, um, very masculine, so to speak. Uh, okay. A lot of these words, if you use Latino, of course, we're talking about a man, but a lot of people would um, go on to say that the term itself is inclusive of everybody. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people are trying to move away from, from that masculine <laughs> language and, and just trying to be neutral and try to be equal about it. I think it is very important um, to at least know the differences between a Latino and a Hispanic, uh, Latino, Hispanic. And, and it's funny that I'm talking to you, that you're Brazilian, um, because I think that's one of the main differences between both of them. Um, Hispanic uh, refers to anybody uh, from a Spanish speaking country descent, which includes um, people from Spain. But excludes Brazilians since exactly. they don't speak Spanish. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where Latino, it's more of a Western Hemisphere kind of uh, identity word. It, that term certainly does include uh, Brazilians, but it excludes Spain. It is mm-hmm. it excludes what it's in our eyes, except for you guys, um, the colonial country, <laughs> yeah. the, the colonists. So uh, Latino, it, it's more of a term where we're pretty much embracing our, our roots, where we're more um, celebrating our indigenous roots and being um, aware of, of where we're coming from. Where Hispanic mm-hmm. tends to be more of a celebratory term for the Spanish, for the colonists. So I proudly identify as a Latina. Uh, of course, Chicana to be more specific. So uh-huh. if people need to know, uh-huh. which is another thing that quite frankly, it, it's a bit bothersome that people automatically need to know where you're from yes. or people need to know well yeah where are you from well okay I'm a Latina but where exactly are you from I'm like why so you why can, does it matter so you can just like put your stereotypes on me and just just get an, an, an assumption or a perception mm-hmm. of who I am based on your biases and everything it, it makes no sense to me I'm like just know me for who I am yeah it doesn't matter what, what my roots or my cultural uh, background is from. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that. And I love that you also brought the point that using the term Latinx, it's also an attempt to adapt the language and become more inclusive. I know that like for Spanish and also Portuguese, we have a lot of words and feminine or masculine. And when we, we try to be more like neutral, we use the masculine word that it kind of bothers me. And I'm glad we are having all those conversations and we are trying to adapt, even though sometimes there's some frictions and maybe we will find better ways to be more inclusive. But I think this step, this first step, it's really important and the language really needs to change. 
I, I entirely agree with, with everything you just said. And I, I think for, for the most part, the, the argument that I do hear against the refusing to use the term or incorporate the term Latinx is exactly that, how, how it violates or, or it doesn't follow certain Spanish rules. Mm-hmm. Again, I, I'm a Chicana born in here in the U.S. I predominantly communicate via Spanglish. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Trust me, when it comes to appropriately using uh, the Spanish language, I am the far least <laughs> suitable person to do it um, because we're, we're communicating or I communicate with, via a language that it's a combination of both the English and the Spanish mm-hmm. and and we even some made up terms that's half Spanish, half English. Mm-hmm. So it, when people come to me uh, with that argument that the, the Latinx is it, violating uh, the Spanish appropriate pronunciation or rules or such, I just say that I, I'm a Spanglish speaking person. Not that I don't care. It's just mm-hmm. something that I, I'm going to use terminology and I'm going to use the language. I'm going to communicate yes. however I feel better mm-hmm. suited to do so. And yeah. I'm just going to do it however I, I find more uh, better for me. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and again, the term itself, we're not forcing it upon people. We, mm-hmm. We're just using it however we think it's mm-hmm. best using it. If you don't want to use the term, don't use it yeah it's as simple as that (laughs) i love that and maybe like the rules need to change too like okay it doesn't apply to like some language like rules and whatever like maybe it needs to be changed so yeah i I love that you mentioned that (laughs) yeah i agree and how would you describe yourself um a chicana born and raised again in East LA and it, it's funny that um, we, we don't have a lot of representation when it comes to film in Hollywood mm-hmm. uh, but whatever little representation we do have uh, it does tend to represent who I am which is your stereotypical uh, Chicano from East LA mm-hmm. <laughs> and I just find it funny that I'm over here uh, advocating for, for representation for, for everybody yet I'm the one that's perhaps being represented the most in, in Hollywood but, but yeah, I, I, I am from East LA, born and raised. I, I still uh, reside here in Southern California. I, I've been here my, my, my entire life. I've never moved from here. I, I just love it. I, I love Southern California. I love the weather. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to sound crazy, but I, I don't mind the earthquakes either. I've come to, to, get, to <laughs> get used to them. Um, I, I love that aspect of it. It's a little price we have to pay for, for the good weather here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, on a personal note, I'm married, been married for, for 16 years. I have four daughters. My primary job, it's um, in the medical field. I'm a certified uh, electron microscopist, uh, which is just a specialized lab technician. And, and I work in a hospital here in, in Los Angeles. I love it. I, I love everything I'm doing. So so everything I'm do- doing with film and Latinx lens and, and reviewing movies and everything, it's more of a hobby, more of a side thing. Yeah, the medical field and science. They're, they're just my passion. My, I just love it. <laughs> I love everything about it. Really cool. And how like the, the pandemic situation it's been like for you, like working in the medical field? Um. It's been rough because uh, unfortunately uh, the media and, and the misinformation that, that's going out there. And unfortunately for us, our, our government isn't the best at, yeah. at handling the, the pandemic. I'm at the front lines, not 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 as a doctor or a nurse, but I am in the laboratory. I am receiving the specimens. I am receiving the biopsies mm-hmm. of patients who do have the virus, mm-hmm. and it's been frustrating to to see what this virus is doing and and everything that's um, it, it's effect on on the patients and everything, and just to turn around and see in the news that. A lot of people, a lot of people aren't taking the, 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 the precautionary advice or the guidelines seriously because they don't think it's real. They think it's a hoax. It, it's sad. It, it's unfortunate because I have to go into work like 10, 15 minutes before my, my shift starts because I have to go through a pre-screening every single day before mm-hmm. I enter work. I have to go in there. They check my temperature. They do all these things to make sure that, that I don't have it. And then I have to go in there mm-hmm. and work and do what I got to do. Mm-hmm. But it, it's been tough just working in the medical field and seeing everything that this virus is, is capable of doing. But I think it's more tough to me 
just seeing the outside aspect of it, just seeing how politicians are using this as a political, and they're just Pilates, just using it as a political movement and just using it just for their own gain and mm-hmm. not necessarily taking these lives and, and caring for these patients and taking the virus and the pandemic as seriously as it's supposed to be taken. It's still rough. It's it's still, we're still working through it, but hopefully we, we can get there and we can get past this. Yeah, I hope so. And thank you for the, the work you, you are doing. This is amazing. And you are one of the hosts of the Latinx Lens podcast, where you and Catherine Gonzalez talk more about the Latinx representation in the film and television. So do you want to tell us a little bit more where were like the main motivations to create your podcast? Yes. So episode one of the podcast, we, we go really in, into depth into that, into where, where the, the podcast came to be. A little bit about myself, a little bit about Catherine. Mm-hmm. And just, just to uh, generalize it, I, I was taking a, a class. It's called Race and Gender in, in American Film. And for week four, we were going to supposed to, we were going to be focusing on Native Americans, Asian Americans, Latinos or Hispanic representation and contributions into film and television. I'm I mean, that should have been a red flag in the first place when you have three different demographics just for one week. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm over here. I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait. And, and I want to learn about, about what Latinos and Hispanics have done and mm-hmm. their contribution to, to the film in Hollywood and throughout the, the its history of, of approximately 100 years. So we were utilizing a textbook, a 500 page textbook to read, to do the readings and such. And I after reading a page and a half, <laughs> just a page and a half on, on Latinos and, and Hispanics and what they contributed and what they've done for, for Hollywood was very disappointing mm-hmm. because a few weeks before that, I had written an article about one of the actresses in, in the silent era from the 1920s in Hollywood. Um, her name was um, Dolores del Rio. And she's a Mexican actress who started in Hollywood in the silent era and then eventually would move back to Mexico and be part of the Mexican golden era of Mexican cinema. So I, I studied her, I, I read her biographies, and then I wrote an article about her. It was for Women's History Month um, back in, in, I think it was March or something like that. I probably wrote more about her, just one actress alone, than this entire book told us about our all all of our history mm. and it was just disappointing so I, I will go on to twitter and i post I, I just send a tweet asking if anybody would would be interested in, in listening or consider listening to to a podcast where we highlight and we shine a light to um latinos and and our representation in films and and such to my surprise uh, it, the support was overwhelming positive reactions and I was very lucky to have Catherine reply to to my tweet and she commented and and volunteered to help me out and and we both and ever since we've been um, just in touch and we 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 created and we came up with all these ideas and now we're here (laughs) Um, so (laughs) I guess in in a way I uh, I owe (laughs) that page and a half of content Mm -hmm. a lot because thanks to that now we have Latinx Lens but it was disappointing. It was disappointing that even in film history, <laughs> our mm-hmm. history is being erased or it's being limited or even just removed from these textbooks. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's been it's been a good road pertaining to, to Latinx lens. The support has been amazing. And even though Catherine and I are always um, in awe and always talking and discussing how we need to improve our our, our podcast because we're, we're not professionals we're just going at this <laughs> with zero experience and also because Catherine and I we, we just met on, on Twitter and we mm-hmm. we've known about each other's um journeys and everything a few uh, probably a year or two before mm-hmm. uh, Latinx Lens ever came to play but yeah it, to get acquainted and, and try to build that chemistry or, or build that genuine or authentic relationship between the both of us we've never met in person I, I'm here in California she's in Texas 
that to even happen without actually physically meeting um mm-hmm. it, it's quite <laughs> it's been a, it's been a treat uh, yeah for sure i i love that i love that you both met via twitter and listening to your podcast i definitely feel the chemistry between you two and without knowing the story i would never like expect that you never met in person for a long time at least so it's really i love this story and also reminds me of the conversation we were having before we recorded that we have a lack of representation we don't see a lot of people talking about our stories so but the good things that we are speaking out talking about our stories even though we might not know how to do it professionally like podcasts same thing for me i never recorded a podcast i never knew how to edit like, audio at all but we are here like trying to do our best and of course there's always something that we can improve and of course we will improve as we go but we are doing this thing now and this is small but it's huge too right because it's small actions that we will like combine with other actions from other people and this can be really big and it's really important Yeah, the lack of representation is certainly our motivator. And it's not necessarily we've come to figure out and as we go we try to dig in into Hollywood past films and actors and actresses that we know very little of. Mm-hmm. There's films out there. I I personally thought we were going to run out of content, that we were going to run out of filmmakers and actors to talk about. But no, the list is pretty long. And I think what we're lacking here is bringing awareness to all the work um, and just having a platform um, mm-hmm. to highlight and just give, just dedicate one episode to filmmakers and actors that have been doing it for all this time. They're just mm-hmm. not given the same amount of attention as their um, counterparts, which are predominantly white. And by the way, for those of you who are listening to us, we are going to list Rosa's podcast and also the article that you mentioned. I think it would be really cool to list to this episode so we can all read and learn more about what also helped you to create a Latinx lens. And talking about impact, uh, I'm really thinking about this question nowadays and I think it's so interesting to think more about it and where Latinxes can make an impact in your opinion. Everywhere. <laughs> uh, I think we, we have this idea that Latinos are only limited to do certain things. And unfortunately, it comes from the lack of history that we're taught in, in our schools. And in addition, the lack of uh, history in general. It can be film mm-hmm. history. It can be uh, political history. It can be history in, in general. Mm-hmm. So we, we build this, this notion that we don't exist. Mm-hmm. And then we sit down in front of the television or in front of a movie theater. And we see the representation that they do depict of us. And we only see ourselves as criminals or as immigrants, as um, people who clean houses or, or, or just do landscaping or people who are nannies. And that's it. And, and I'm talking from living in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is 50% Latino, uh, predominantly Mexican. Also, um, California was once part of Mexico. Yeah. Um, so so the history w- with the country is quite, quite lengthy. But... We, we don't see the whole representation. I, I've, I work in the medical field. I've never seen my story been told in, 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 uh, in, in television or maybe television. I think television does have a little bit of an advantage um, over film. Television does have a bit more representation. So in that, in that sense, Hollywood has a lot of catching up to do. But I've met doctors and I've met lawyers and I've met a lot of professors. Um, I, I've met a wide range of careers. Uh, where Latinos are present, but we just don't see it represented. We just don't see it in film. We don't see it in television as much. We've been everywhere. <laughs> We've yeah. always been here from doctors to medical assistants, medical professionals, to lawyers, to politicians, to civil rights um, activists, all the way to farm workers that we would not be able to to sit down on our table and eat Yeah. If it weren't for those farm workers picking up the, the food for us. So we've been everywhere. I, I think it's just a, a matter of opportunity and giving that same equal advantage, not advantage, but the same equal opportunity. We're, we're not seeking 
when when I advocate for representation and when I advocate for not only representation in front of the screen, but also in directing and writing and producing, and on top of that, in, in film criticism as well. And it's directly reflective when you when you see 80% or 90% of, of Hollywood films directed by white men. It's not, not a surprise to see that 75% of critics, Rotten Tomato approved critics, are white men as well. And when you have white men talking about white men films, and of course, it's it's just that biased and, and having just one lens telling us what films to watch mm -hmm. and telling us rating movies just because of their experience. I'm advocating for representation all across the board. When I advocate for representation, I don't want you to hire me as a film critic because I am a woman of color. I want you to hire me because of my talents, because of my capabilities. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to be representing or be hiring directors or filmmakers because of who they are. Mm -hmm. All I want is for you to give them the same amount of chances, same opportunities. Give them the interview. Just yes. let us get into that door. Just give us the interview and then we'll show you what we got. That, that's all we're asking for. <laughs> we yeah. don't want anything handed to us. We just want you to, okay, come in for the interview and then we'll show you what we got. Yeah, I, I love that. Like, get to know more about us. Let's have the interview. Let's let's have a conversation. I love that. And tell me the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear these phrases. The first one is your superpower. Motherhood. I think all mothers are, are superheroes. Uh, we, we, we manage, we've developed this, <laughs> this ability to multitask. We can do 10 things at once and we, we still, and we're doing all of this like with two hours of sleep. So <laughs> certainly motherhood. <laughs> and a dream. Equality, e equality on, on, across the spectrum to give everybody. I know when, when I advocate for Latino and Latinx representation, I'm obviously gonna, gonna leave out other demographics that are perhaps even far less represented than, than us. But equality for everybody, just give, mm -hmm. give us all the, the equal amount of representation. And then, yeah. We really love that. It's also my dream. And your favorite place. My vehicle, when I'm driving back, when I'm driving to work, <laughs> when I'm driving back from work, it's my only alone time that I get. I get a lot of thinking done. A lot of uh -huh. my creative process goes goes on while I'm driving. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the Latinx lens, actually the, 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 the title Latinx lens came when I was driving, I think it was back home. Oh, really? Nice. And I, I think the name is fantastic. It's perfect. Yes. Um, yeah, I was driving back home because I'm, I'm assistant editor of Idol, which is in their own league. And that website mm -hmm. is dedicated to female representation in the film and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and television. So we're, we're always talking about the female lens and the, and the female gaze and, and the male gaze and, the, and all that. So I'm like, well, if we're talking about Latinos, then we can go to Latinx and we'll just talk about Latinx lens. And, and the term can be utilized in different manners and, mm -hmm. and we can use it as me and Catherine's Latin excellence how we mm -hmm. are viewing things from our perspective but also how Hollywood's camera lens has been representing us mm -hmm. um, how they've been developing our Latin excellence and how therefore society is looking at us because of how they've been representing us so it's just a variety of ways you can use the term although that didn't come to me until uh, weeks later and I was like wow <laughs> And that was pretty bright. <laughs> that was pretty brilliant. <laughs> really cool. Love that. And a movie. Of course, I needed to ask you that. <laughs> yeah, Stand and Deliver. Uh, Stand and Deliver. It, it's perhaps my favorite movie of all time. The movie I've seen the most ever. And it, of course, it, it takes place in East LA. And it's about math professor Jaime Escalante, uh -huh. um, who uh, was teaching math in, at Garfield High School, where I also attended, of course. And he uh, managed to um, to teach a, a group, I think it's 18 students, um, uh, high school students, calculus and, and help them pass the AP calculus exam. And of course, we were, we're from barrios, with low income. Um, they, they weren't looked upon as bright students. This is these type of tests 
are only for for bright students people are going to go to college people are going to be professionals and yeah to have latinos to have chicanos predominantly chicanos take this exam is something that was never heard of it was not even possible to think about because it, they, they didn't see these kids as as capable of taking the exam nonetheless passing it how they mm-hmm. did so stand and deliver it's definitely left an everlasting impact in me and even when I was taking calculus in college I would watch this film like three four times a week just as a motivation and nice. it helped yeah it helped I love that I really like that I didn't watch this movie but I saw it is available on Netflix so I'm going to watch it today and also link to this description so we can all watch amazing <laughs> yes i'd love to hear what, what you think um, mm-hmm. but certainly especially that intro there there's a little montage of mm-hmm. east la and mm-hmm. that's just my hometown that's where i'm from and certainly a, a sense of pride every time i watch that movie cool and what is the one thing that the latinx lens brought you that you didn't expect for the first time it made me think why I, I view things in a certain way, my own biases, my own perceptions. And evidently, it, it got me thinking about why are, is our community represented the way it is or why is it invisible? Why? It's just got me thinking so many things. <laughs> uh, uh, certainly something I would not have taken the time to just sit and think about if it was not for this this podcast. It helped me open my eyes And, and it's helped me, my eyes to different stories. And it's made me more, I don't want to say humbled. It's allowed me to be more open to, to learning other stories. Mm-hmm. It's also helped me to be more understanding. Mm-hmm. Not understanding, but open to see other people's perspective. And this includes people who think differently of me. Um, people who have different political beliefs or, or any religious beliefs or anything in general. Um, different from mine. Uh, I, I've come to learn from... Uh, it's very. It's been more of a philosophical impact on me mm-hmm. than, than I thought. It, it's made me be more open, more understanding, more... I'm willing to listen. To, to anybody who's who's has different views from myself than than myself and it's something that I probably would have never thought of if, if it weren't for, for this podcast of course the, the obvious just learning about these actors and filmmakers uh-huh. that have been trailblazing all this time we just recently recorded an episode on, on Raul Julia who I only knew about from from the Adams family mm-hmm. uh, as Gomez Adams and uh-huh. that was my only my only extent the, the only thing I, I knew about him but we went into his filmography we, we saw the documentary about him And man, he was just fascinating. So, so I've also learned the importance of, of representation. Um, we, we always get asked, um, well, I do. I, I don't want to speak for Catherine. I always get asked, why does it matter who is portraying what character? Isn't the story of the film what matters? Which I understand the argument. Mm-hmm. But after seeing the documentary of Raul Julia, um, who's Puerto Rican, And the first thing they asked them was, who inspired you? Who inspired you to go down this journey to do all of this? And he said, Jose Ferrer, who is the only Latino to ever to win the Oscar for, for a leading actor in the history of the Academy, which is 90-something years. Only one Latino has ever won the, the, the Oscar for a leading actor. That was back in the 1950s. <laughs> so we're going for almost 70 years. Oh. Jose Ferrer, also a Latino, uh, also Puerto Rican, and he got it for um, Cyrano de Bergerac, which is a, like a stage, it's a play as well. There wasn't no Jose Ferrer, there would be no Raul Julia. Without Raul Julia, we would not have the Lin Manuel Miranda that we have now, who is also being a success in theater because of these past two people. So, Which, which further validates the importance of representation. If you don't see yourself up there, if you don't see that people like you, that look like you, that talk like you, that you can identify with, are able to win Academy Awards, to be on films like The Adams Family that everybody are going to know about. 
Yeah. Uh, that, that, that those movies are going to be the Halloween <laughs> tradition. So every new generations of people are going to know who Raul Julia is because of those films. So if we don't have those influences and we don't have those role models, we, we just think ourselves as limited to certain dreams when we can just go out there and do whatever we set our minds into. Yeah. So, so bringing it back to people asking me, why does it matter? Who, who is behind the thing? Isn't the performance what matters? Yes, it's true. The story matters. The performance matters. But when it comes to movies and televisions unconsciously developing this stereotype and these biases on certain demographics, hell yeah, it matters. It's going to matter. It's going to matter when you only have Latinos and Blacks and all these minorities as your criminals because a lot of kids are going to see this they don't know what's going on. They don't know these movies aren't real. And they're going to think those type of people are the only criminals there is. Yes, yes. So yes, it does matter when it comes to representation. But yes, no, Latinx Lens has been very essential. It's it's responsible for my growth and my understanding. And, 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 I, and I even dare to say maturity uh, when it comes to art and creativity and representation and being open to mm-hmm. other people's perspectives and, and try to understand. It, it certainly made me realize and, and it's embedded that idea in me to never judge people, no matter what their ideas is, without knowing their motives, without knowing their background, because it makes a lot of difference when you do. Amazing. I, I love all those points that you brought. It is so amazing that you are also sharing all this research you're doing with all of us. So this is an amazing treat. And what are the resources that have helped you along the way? Tell us all your secrets. Well, school, school, school is the main one at, at, the, at now because as I'm working also for my film and media studies degree, I'm also working on another science degree. But also working on a Chicano Chicana studies uh, degree as well. So I'm working on three bachelors at oh. the moment. Whoa. And I mean, the pandemic makes it the online thing much easier. Mm-hmm. It's just a bit more easier to do. But learning about my own history, it's unbelievable that I have to earn, a, I have to work on a bachelor's degree to learn about my own history. And that has certainly opened up my, my, my eyes to, to a lot of things and how film has influenced that because Hollywood is predominantly uh, dominated and it's pretty much controlled by heterosexual white men, mm-hmm. how they managed to represent us all these years, how that has influenced a lot of, of, of the social injustices that we're still currently experiencing. Um, it wasn't that long ago where, where there's a still a lot of marches going on uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement as well. I've purchased a lot of books. Uh, I've never read so many books in my life as I have in the past few months. <laughs> uh, books, autobiographies, memoirs, uh, film history books. Uh, mm-hmm. There's books out there about Latinos and, and our influence in, 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 in Hollywood and such. It's just a matter of searching for them and trying to go out there and, and get them. And of course, Google. Google always comes in handy when, <laughs> when necessary. Mm-hmm. I predominantly just use it to get like the years and, and, and filmmakers and screenplay people um, from from particular films but don't solely focus on let it be my my main source of of research amazing and i have been thinking about this uh, a lot lately and i think it's really important to have kind of like this introspect exercise so i'm curious to know which advice would you give to yourself five years ago Never stop trying. Never Mm -hmm. stop working. Don't lose the eagerness to learn. Don't allow your fears and insecurities to cloud your decisions. We we need to get past those insecurities by by facing them. Mm -hmm. And I I may be a bit hypocritical because I'm working on that myself. (laughs) I have a lot of insecurities to work on, especially on uh, more of a self-esteem. So again, it's something I'm working on. I, I've been able to to do podcasts, being being a guest on on YouTube videos and such. So it, it's getting there. Uh, something I would have never done uh, mm-hmm. if you would have asked me probably a few months ago. Just never giving up. And and as a woman um, and the mother of four daughters, four little girls that are going to grow up to be women, um, I think the best advice I would give myself and I would give them is to never allow themselves to to worry too much about being 
uh, it's checking off the social norms of being a woman, uh, of being ladylike, so uh-huh. to speak. Don't be too nice. Don't don't let people uh, judge. Just um, assume of your capabilities just because you were a woman. <laughs> just go out there and do what what, what we got to do. So don't spend too much time worrying about whether I'm being nice enough, whether I'm going to be called a, a, the B word <laughs> mm-hmm. or whether um, I'm checking off these boxes. Because at the end of the day, it's not going to matter. You're never going to please everybody. So just go out there, be the fearless person you can be. Just accomplish what, what you went out there to get for. Amazing. I loved everything you said. And I love that you also mentioned the only way to pass insecurities is to face them. And this is amazing. I love that. I really enjoyed our conversation. I think I'm going to rewatch your episode many, many times after because you you brought a lot of really important points. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to leave uh, the last minutes for you to talk about anything you want to say. <laughs> No, no, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and, and thank you for doing what, everything you do. Um, you may think it's not a lot, but, but having these conversations and, and your interviews with other uh, Latinx content creators um, is important. It's important because all of our voices do matter and, and what you're doing is pre- it's darn amazing. So thank you for what you're doing. <laughs> I will give this back to you. Thank you for everything you're doing. And yeah, that'll be really cool. I will continue to listen to the Latinx lens and putting a lot of movies in my queue. So I'm really excited about that too. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. No, thank you for listening. And, and thank you for considering our, our judgment and, and taking our word and, and actually watching this film. It, it means a lot to us that people are actually listening and, and considering our, our viewpoints. Mm-hmm. And yeah, if people can follow us, that, that'd be really great. Um, social media platforms, which is Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Latinx Lens. Um, you can also follow me on the same three platforms at Rosa's Reviews. And Latinx Lens is available, podcast on every podcast um, platform. It's Apple, Spotify, Google Play, everything at Latinx Lens. And again, thank you so much. This was a treat. Awesome. Thank you. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it and had a lot of fun as I did. Feel free to share your thoughts and feedback with us. Our handle is Latinx in power in all social media channels. So feel free to send us a message always with kindness and I would love to hear your thoughts. 